Well, boa tarde. Okay, uh, good afternoon to everyone that is that are following this first workshop of Brazilian Network for Citizen Science. I'm Natalia Guilard Lopez, coordinator of research in citizen science and environmental conservation of the Federal University ABC and founding member of the Brazilian Network for Citizen science. This afternoon, I will be the mediator of the table called Engage Engagement and Good Practices. The proposal of this table is offering elements to qualify a discussion and be the base for proposals for strategies of engagement and good practices in citizen science. We would like to discuss from the contents and and examples brought by the speakers, the barriers that hinder the advancement of initiatives in citizen science, as well as the existing opportunities to overcome these barriers. The speakers will also uh, tell us about their experiences with work in network in science, citizen science and lessons learned by taking part in coordinating projects in the area. The contributions of speakers and participants during the debate will subsidize the preparation of a letter of intentions that we want to share with the stakeholders as politic policy makers and decision makers containing recommendations to promote and support citizen science in Brazil. To the participants, we ask them to uh, leave their questions in the Q&A uh, chat in Zoom or in, in the chat in YouTube so we can share the questions and give voice to your doubts during our discussion session. Before starting, I will uh, make a brief presentation of each of our speakers. The first speaker will be Jennifer Schirk, She's work, she works aiming to increase and enrich practices for all of those who manage, implement, and guide uh, projects in citizen science. Her research explored the efficacy of, of the use of citizen science for scientific research and conservation, especially in the social ecologic Con, uh, complex context. She has a degree in biology of co conservation and has a master's and PhD in uh, natural resources from Cornell. She is the executive director of Sci C Science uh, Association, the CSI, the American Association for Citizen Science. Then we will have Karin Swacha. Karin is a researcher in the uh, project co-design citizen observatory services for the European Open Science Cloud in the Institute of Marine Sciences uh, of Barcelona. Currently, she is in her doctorate studies in the uh, Open University of Catalonia. Her uh, investigation focused the management of knowledge in citizens observatories. She is interested in the connection between man knowledge management and citizen science, governance, and nature. She works with environmental organizations for more than 15 years and in the last few years with a focus in the management of database networks and information, especially with open data of the University of Columbia. And she's part of the Ibero-American Network of Participative uh, Science, RECAP. Then we will have Gina Leiti. Gina has a degree in production, communication, and culture by the School of Communication of the Federal University of Bahia. She's an expert in project management, producer, and screenwriter in the program of Open Science and Amazon Waters in Wildlife Conservation Society. And she's part of the team uh, for citizens. Uh, Brazilian Network of our Citizen Science in the Amazon. And then we will have Simone Milach. She's master in management systems with focus on citizen science in marine and coastal environments uh, from the University of Rio de Janeiro. She has a degree in uh, environmental management by the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. 
and a degree in the communication from the Santa Federal University of Santa Catarina and oceanography in Rio Grande Federal University. She is coordinator of Blue Change to promote citizen science in Brazil and responsible for the communication observatory of the forest code. Thank you very much for your presence, for accepting our invitation to take part in this event. And without much further ado, I pass the floor to our first guest, who is Jennifer. Jennifer, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And it is an honor to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to speak and connect with all of you. I also very much appreciate the work of the translators in uh, sharing these words um, that I am unable to share with you myself in Portuguese. So thank you for um, the opportunity to uh, present beyond the barriers of languages. Give me just a moment to make this a presentation. And I, I'm glad to speak with you today a little bit about networks and the practices that unite us across this very broad field and the way that we can build collaborations to affect that unity. As Natalia mentioned, uh, I work very specifically in my research on complex conservation contexts and how these research collaborations can help build shared perspectives in areas of research such as fisheries. And while I won't talk much about that work today, I will say that many of the lessons that I have learned from work in that context have carried through my reasons for wanting to support and build a career in supporting networks and collaborations across many different styles of citizen science in this field. And I will say that my work in this area has, uh, has started long before I even knew there was a name for the term and practice citizen science. This is a picture of me more years ago than I would like to admit on a research collaboration trip in Mexico to count sea turtles through a scholarship to attend an Earthwatch expedition. And Earthwatch, many of you may be familiar with, is an organization that sends volunteer collaborators around the world to assist with scientific research. And this opportunity really um, empowered me as a learner. I was 16 at the time and as a researcher. And those two experiences uh, really made me uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to both learn and take part in real world research at the same time. And this has informed the growth of my career. I did mention that that work and experience took place long before I knew there was a name for the work in this field. And I have since learned that even though uh, many of us use the term citizen science and the organization I represent right now is called the Citizen Science Association, the work that we aim to support has many names. But the thing that brings us together, although many people have tried to define it, I tend to not use a definition for work in this field and rather a sentiment around why we do this work. It is something that brings together the power of science for everyone and the power of everyone for science. And with that in mind, no matter the terms or the disciplines or the approaches that we use to this work, I wanted to think and share a little bit with you about what we know about the similarities of practices in this field, despite the differences that help us understand the many ways that we can approach this work, whether that's doing chemistry or online research investigating Alzheimer's disease, if it's birding or looking out at the night sky, um, all of these approaches come together around the process of science. And I had the honor early in my uh, academic career in this field to work with a team led by Rick Bonney at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology 
to look at the process of science and what the steps are in that process and the many different ways in which um, non-professionals or non-affiliated uh, individuals can get involved in the scientific process. And if we think about that here, that process, although there are many different ways that we can think about that as well, runs everywhere from starting with a question to uh, designing protocols and data collection methods to collecting samples and observations all the way through analyzing, interpreting the, those data, and then starting the process all over again. And with this uh, team of collaborators, we set out to identify that there are some projects in this shared endeavor that at the time we were calling public participation in scientific research. That there are some approaches where um, members of the public are involved really at that level of collecting data or sharing observations, and that's all, and sending those data off to scientists. And through those collaborations, scientists and scientific organization, organizations can amass very large data sets at the level of continents and even around the globe. And with those data sets, they can do highly sophisticated analyses um, of, the, of the data to draw conclusions, um, to absorb any um, uncertainties in the data based on the, the massive data sets. And the experiences of the, the participants in that in those processes may be as simple as sharing knowledge they already have or learning new skills to participate in this project. In other ways of collaborating, some projects involve people a little bit more deeply, such as being involved in designing the data collection procedures or analyzing the data, whereas others may in fact be informed from the very beginning by the people who are taking part in these processes. So a community, for example, may point to a problem, define what needs to be addressed, and then work in collaboration with scientists to help guide um, the, the data collection protocol development and analyses procedures to then take those data back to make change in their community. And through these collaborative and co-created approaches, um, very personal experiences can be brought to identifying and addressing the problems at hand. Um, and oftentimes these projects are uh, called community-driven research or participatory research but share the same opportunities for collaborations between uh, scientists and members of the public. Now, I'm giving a very high level overview just for a short presentation as, and a starting point for a conversation about the many different ways that these research partnerships can be approached. Um, and so this is a lot of information that I can point you towards more resources. But the, the thing that is shared about all of them is that in coming to these projects, design choices need to be made as to whose interests are guiding the development of that project, whether that is more driven by the scientific need or more driven by the public interests. And recognizing that those design choices will strongly influence the outcomes that result. And again, these are very general um, learnings and outputs. And from these design choices, um, there is the possibility to affect, no matter what the project results, there is the opportunity to affect individual learning. There is the opportunity to affect uh, scientific um, analyses and publications, and there is the opportunity to affect um, change, whether that is at the global scale in things like sustainable development goals, 
or at the local scale in terms of changing environmental regulations to secure better personal and environmental health. Now, not every project will or should do all of those things, but any project with uh, very intentional design choices informed both by the needs for the science and the needs for the participants can affect any of those choices. And again, the personal interest and lens and perspective that I bring to this is working in very complex environmental contexts where all of those things often come together and scientific research and local change are all embedded within this system that involves everything from politics to media to regulations. Um, and yet, these partnerships can be established with care to bring together perspectives to develop a shared understanding of a problem relying on data collection to ground choices that are made and personal experiences and understandings that inform and influence um, the way that science is done to build shared understandings about things that oftentimes can start from very different perspectives. And I will note again from the beginning that I have worked in fisheries management contexts. And one example that I could point you towards is research that has been done in the US South Atlantic over the past, I think now four years to build collaborations very intentionally between fishermen, fishing regulatory agencies and fishery scientists to do citizen science together in a way that reflects the needs of the fishermen, the data and decision-making pipelines, and to come towards a process where everybody can feel good about their shared needs, interests, knowledges, and, uh, and even values in many cases to make wise decisions about very complex um, situations. But I will say that all of these things requ require collaborations. And these collaborations um, are necessary, not just at the level of any individual project, but the way I work right now is to help build collaborations at the level of a field. And that is because the knowledge about how these collaborations come together and the knowledge to inform how any project makes design choices is growing on a daily basis. And so the knowledge can no longer come from any one person or any one project to say that this is the right way to do citizen science or this is the way that you should do citizen science. That knowledge is held across the thousands of projects that take place in this field all around the globe um, and in new ways every single day. And so there are some basic best practices that can be offered. This is just a set of them um, that can be absorbed by networks to help build projects that can affect data at large scales and experiences that at the same time are very personally meaningful and impactful on the ground by everyone who takes part. And so to share these best practices that are being developed across this broad field, we are all in our own ways working to build and to contribute to networks to affect connecting and sharing. And I'm honored to, to share again, a couple of few insights about the work that I have done uh, to build a network um, in the United States, to build collaborations across networks and to help um, inform or share ways that you might build a network in Brazil. So the first thing that I can say about the Citizen Science Association in the US is that we do exist to connect people. The people who are running and managing these projects are the ones who know how it works best 
And by actively putting people in touch with each other, they can best share the new knowledge, again, that is being developed every day. And we're excited to be actively, as in just over the past few months, be putting new uh, platforms in place to do this in very personal ways so people can be recognized for the knowledge that they are bringing to this field and can be actively sharing as individuals and recognized for their leadership in the growth of this field. And I'll mention this platform again right before I close. I will say that the reason, again, that we do this is to share best practices, emerging practices, and innovations. And there are so many out there, and I'm going to highlight only just a few here that include best practices for ensuring the quality of data that's collected, that those data are trustworthy in the way they're collected and managed and stored, that they're collected in ways that are ethical and that reflect reflect um, equitable partnerships between scientists and communities, that these partnerships can be done in ways that influence the outcomes that we want to share and the policies that we want to affect. No matter what of those outcomes are relevant to you, not all projects will be designed for learning or for policies but there are resources out there on all of these things. And so associations can play a very critical role in sharing these resources as they emerge and helping people find the resources that are most relevant to them. And we are working to establish ways to affect, <clears throat> excuse me, the sharing of those resources across a very widely dispersed network in many disciplines, in many contexts, and the core services that we are providing in CSA and then working to collaborate on with others are to develop online resources and web content, to host a journal, and to facilitate professional learning experiences right now grounded in um, biennial conferences that we hold, but soon to be also including courses. And I. And I know that there are many ways that we can collaborate with others, <laughs> excuse me, in other contexts across the globe to do this better. I will say from the very beginning of our association and others, dating back to 2014, there's a very basic memorandum of understanding that's grounded in these three central things that was signed between CSA, the European Citizen Science Association, and the Australian Citizen Science Association. These three associations are now revisiting that MOU and are very much looking forward to uh, broadening that MOU with other networks and associations that want to join. Because even though we have grounded these things in a journal and web resources and in conferences, there is a lot more that we can still do to actualize those collaborations. So we do have a field-wide journal. Our editor-in-chief is working very actively to broaden um, the, the relevance of this journal and the representation of this journal to a global community. It's called Citizen Science Theory and Practice. And we would encourage anyone who is interested in being an author, a reviewer, or an editor in getting in touch to learn more. The European Union has uh, been investing in web tools that are sharing best practices in a really powerful interactive platform that elevates new things and encourages community collaborations and sharing. And I'm looking forward to ways that we might be able to involve our association in collaborating on that front as well. And then conferencing has, being, has been taking place on different continents every year, alternating years generally between North America and then Europe and Australia. Um, and we need to do better to be collaborating to engage a global audience and maybe one day host a global event. Our conference is coming up entirely online in May. And I am, again, excited about this new platform that we have and would welcome others to look at ways that we might even share platforms 
to engage an international network of collaborators to make sure that the people that we are connecting expand beyond geographies. Because even though geography can serve as a barrier and language can serve as a barrier, the things that unite us are more powerful and we can find ways to share our knowledge and expertise um, beyond those barriers to make this field as powerful as possible. So there is additionally a citizen science global partnership to this effect. This is not specifically a partnership between associations, but it is a partnership working to bring attention to citizen science globally that is grounded in uh, these international, uh, these continental associations. And there are activities that also are drawing on the expertise from other associations such as um, PPSR Core, which is a data standard for sharing data about citizen science projects. That is an international collaboration that is applicable to any project anywhere on any topic. So the more that we can do these things, the stronger we can be and the stronger our projects can be. And I do look forward to building these collaborations and this field. And thank you for the opportunity to open this conversation with you today. Thank you, Jennifer, so much for your great talk. Uh, we are having, we are going to have time to discuss this a little bit more, but I, I noted several things here to, to discuss. Thank you so much. Uh, now I will call Karen to give her speech. Okay, great. Can you hear me properly? Yes. Great. Thank you so much, Natalia. Uh, okay, it's going to be quite challenging the present, my presentation after a great presentation of Jennifer, and especially very visual myself. Uh, my presentation is going to be a little bit a uh, result of uh, early thoughts of my research and uh, combination with my experience with the recap. Then here I'm trying to consolidate a little bit the the experience from my colleagues. Uh, give me a moment, I will share my screen. So, uh, when Natalia gave me the, the question that we were trying to approach today related to engagement, proven practices, or good practices, I prefer to use ex the, the expression proven practices. It means in some point words with that this doesn't mean are the perfect one. But um, essentially, uh, I am trying to approach to, to answer this question from the perspective of governance in citizen science. Governance of what? In this case, governance of knowledge from one side and governance in citizen science networks. I'm trying to combine some early thoughts or reflections or proven practice and lessons learned. So let's start with the first part. One of the uh, important topics for me nowadays is uh, how are we approaching to understand the management of the knowledge in citizen science, and especially if we think as a citizen science, a system of knowledge production. This is a very interesting approach for me because this is bringing a lot of questions and raising some challenges that we have been discussing discussing for a quite while within the citizen science community. What are the questions that I am talking about? When we talk as a citizen science as a knowledge production, we are thinking about what are the rules, what are the agreements and the decision-making system for producing knowledge in citizen science. Who are defining those rules? How those rules are defined? Which instruments are we using? which arenas or which spaces for participation are we using for creating this rule or agreement? And especially one of the big questions that nowadays we are addressing is, really are we reproducing the same traditional scientific system of knowledge production in citizen science? And when I said the same traditional, it means the same that we are using for uh, creating knowledge in the conventional um, way of uh, scientific method, and 
What about knowledge as a commons or a common good in citizen science? And this is very important for us in terms of understanding if the way of governing this knowledge is affecting the engagement, the sustainability, and the real participation of the citizen scientists in this case. So this is like a kind of the big question that I am connected with the topic of the engagement and sustainability in citizen science. And here, I just wanted to share with you some of the main issues that we are thinking about and trying to put on the table this discussion to continue growing, you know, in experience, lessons learned, and try to address as a big community, understanding our cultural context, to try to find different kinds of solutions to this. One of the first questions and the most common one that we have been addressing within the citizen science community is the validation of knowledge. And when I talk about that, I talk about data quality. Even if we have uh, evolving in this discussion, discussion related to if the citizen science data are good or not for decision making, for real research, as some people used to mention, and we nowadays have a lot of evidence that indeed uh, the citizen science data is crucial for taking decision and have been providing, as I will show uh, later, more than 60% of the, for instance, biodiversity data available in the world. Still, we have a lot of challenges to decide why many uh, official system information across the world are not accepting the citizen science data and as official part or as an official source of information, why is it still considered that there is not enough quality for that? What is happening in this uh, system of validation knowledge that we need as a, as a community to try to understand, overcome, or to try to approach from different perspectives, uh, overcoming the approach to thinking in, a, you know, in the uh, precision of the data instead of the volume or completeness of the data. And there is a lot of discussion about that. Still, we are discussing about who is an expert and who is not an expert within the field for validating the knowledge produced, uh, produced by citizen scientists, what is the way to peer review the information and the peer review the outputs coming from the research. Incentive uh, within this is a very important issue. We want to have more scientists and more communities involved in this process, but essentially our model for producing and our model for evaluating, in this case, my point here is more related to scientists. Our model to evaluate the performance of researchers nowadays, I am talking especially in the context of Latin America and in Colombia, that is where I was used to work, are not really creating incentive for the scientists to work with the, with the people. We don't use to measure the performance of a researcher by the number of participation or all the time that takes to really create a process with a community, to really work with the hand by hand with the community in a citizen science process. Uh, we still are very focused on evaluating the performance of scientists according to the number of articles or number of papers or certain kind of um, scientific outputs that are not considering really the citizen science as part of this uh, performance that require a lot of time. And we consider that this is one of the, uh, well, we can say very specific, but a very important problem for really uh, having scientists involved and with the desire to engage in a long-term process that usually citizen science is, even if we consider just a contributive model, as Jennifer mentioned before, where people are only involved in collecting data, but even in this case, require a lot of effort to design a protocols where the people can really follow and engage. Then, uh, I don't want to mention the other side of this problem that is the incentive in terms of community participation because this is a big field still. Unfortunately, uh, fortunately, there are a lot of uh, research coming out about what are the motivations behind the people and how to incentivize really the participation of community. Another important issue related to knowledge governance in this case is the distribution of benefits coming out from the scientific outputs. 
how are we going to, to how are we defining these benefits and especially this is connected to something related to visibility and knowledge we still are in the discussion about how to include or not our co-researchers or our contributor, contributors, what implications that are behind of that in the distribution of benefits, for instance, when there are uh, financial resources for certain kind of topic, and this is assigned according to the existing research, and this is more related to a certain kind of organization of universities or big institutional research, even if the local organization has been participating in many ways in citizen science activities and so on. And they are not, they are not really part of this big, like a kind of cake in terms of financial support. And this is a discussion that are not very easy to have, but we need to have it within the citizen science field. Um, and the last one that I want just to put on the table is the one related to sharing results and outputs. We still have to work on the topic of licenses. How are we going to share in the information? Even if we, as a citizen science, consider part of the open science movement across the world, we know that uh, many of, I, in this case, I don't have the evidence, but we have we know that many of the articles of the paper resulting or using uh, citizen science data are not open access. This is not an idea to, you know, to, uh, to try to find punish, punish or, or people about uh, who is responsible for that. It's more to understand what is happening behind that. It's lack of financial support, our policies that are not incentivizing really open access, how can we assure that the people that is contributing with data in citizen science really can access to the outputs as a result of the scientific research? There are then many things to discuss. I just want to I just want to share with you something that it was interesting for me in terms of understanding what is happening in terms uh, with the open data in citizen science. And is this research produced in 2017 trying to answer some of the questions that we are thinking about, and is how open is the data, you know, uh, produced by citizen science. And just one very short uh, part of the results. And first, as, we mentioned, as I mentioned before, 60% of the all observation in GIF are produced by citizen science, even if it just is the 10% of the data sets of GIF. And the interesting thing that they were checking the kind of licenses that were assigned to these data sets and see how restrictive or not were uh, these licenses according to the source. And the interesting point is, was that citizen science projects were often associated with more restrictive licenses than the other. And then in this case arise a lot of questions that what is happening with citizen science data? Why are we using maybe in this case, uh, for instance, creative common licenses more restricted in terms of uh, no debate, no commercial use, or why are we restricted the use of students with a lot of information? Why even in another case is that there was similar data from another kind of institutions? Many questions that we need to address to understand the um, agreement behind a citizen science project. Uh, oof, I think that I am, I know, I'm fine. I think with the time. So, uh, some of the path I would like to call like this to continue exploring these issues is uh, in three areas that I would like to point it out. One is validation and is the necessity to work on standards and protocols co-created within the citizen science community that really allows us to understand our reality in terms of producing data and information, reach or search for interoperability, and uh, have kind of protocols uh, located according to our uh, citizen science needs. In this case, I think that community peer review must be a practice that needs to be incentivized, that the, really the community involved in this process need to validate and have an agreement about who has access to the outputs of a scientific or citizen science scientific result. 
incentive uh, for scientists in terms of the use of all metrics. I know that this is just one of the many alternatives, but it's important to keep an eye on this kind of um, incentive for scientists to produce or to participate or involve in citizen science activities. And in terms of benefits, the traceability of the use of the data and the knowledge uh, with the communities in terms of how are we using their data. We know that nowadays there are a lot of effort to try to cite the DOI or to use uh, electronic ways to trace who is using the data and how to cite and recognize information. But many of the users, we don't have the way to really acknowledge their participation, to really show them where, who are using and who, what benefits are producing with that data. And from the perspective of the citizen observatory, for instance, that we can call this kind of knowledge half of citizen science, we have a lot of uh, challenges of that. And we consider that it's a part of the contribution to the solution of this uh, distribution of benefits of the citizen science. The, in this case, the point is that we need to keep questioning and we need to keep evolving in terms of the system of production of, of citizen science. Still, we have a long path to work on that. But um, as well as we have a long path to, to work, I think that we have a very interesting um, goals or a very interesting results that, that we have developed as a community. And I would like to connect this with the second part of the question that Natalia was asking us about what are the values and principles that we stand for? And she was saying, and you personally, what are the values or principles that you identify when you are working in a citizen science project? And I still feel very identified with this work of the Open and Collaborative Science in Development Network. And essentially, we are starting from the same point that they say that definitely um, we, this model of open science is not really challenging the core values of science and that we need to do that and ask these kind of questions that are very complex to, to address, but we need to do as a citizen science community. And from that reflection are coming these kind of manifestos. The, the left one is another, is another, it's a very interesting manifesto that I, I really like and I'm trying to understand better that is the Fab City Manifesto. But now I just want to mention the one that is quite well spread, the Open and Collaborative Science Manifesto, and especially because their principles that they are addressing, I think that in especially in terms of knowledge commons are a very interesting approach within the citizen science community. And I think that we need to start to understand uh, really the knowledge as a common good within the citizen science and, and what are the implications behind that. There are other principles, the several principles that I really uh, consider very accurate for our work related to cognitive justice, situated openness, right to research, equitable collaboration, inclusive infrastructure, and obviously the purpose behind all of that that we are doing is the sustainable development. But uh, until this point, it was uh, essentially my my kind of early reflection or early thoughts about how to connect governance knowledge with the engagement and practices and values that might address our work. This second part is about the governance of networks. It's a short summary of our experience trying to create the citizen Ibero-American participatory science network recap. And from the beginning, we were the same, doing the same, no? That in the citizen science project, how to define rules, agreement, and decision systems, a decision making system within a network. Being conscious that this is a very important, like, uh, key point for really moving forward in any collaborative work. So, our proven practices and lessons learned, I can try to summarize this that first ask, as the essential and the picky questions of the, that we don't want to have. And when I said that it was, we were collaborative for almost, I think more than six months, one year, trying to say, okay, what are the essential questions that we need to answer to consolidate us as a citizen science, as a citizen science network? Uh, how organized, how are we going to take decisions? Who is going to participate? Are we working with working groups? Uh, how to select the people? 
and the picky questions are related to financial sustainability. If we have money, we, how are we going to manage that? Who takes decisions uh, or important or represent the network? All of this we are doing like a long list to try to prioritize what questions we need to answer or not. Uh, working groups with definitely the strategy that has been working for us. Uh, all of this is voluntary work. Then uh, really finding people who are very passionate about this and will to volunteer their time and their skills to grow as a community has been a very, very enrichable uh, lesson learned. At the beginning, we search for reference, inspiration, and lessons from another citizen science association, including the United States Association here and the European and Australian, trying to understand um, what has been their uh, lessons learned, but especially to locate this according to our cultural context in Ever America. Uh, another important point is was identify our internal skills, but more than that, it was recognizing our own dynamics and understanding and our own rhythm. What I am talking about with that. Uh, as a community, we have a lot of dreams and expectation about how to grow their network, how to create a lot of products that can expand the impact of citizen science. But the reality is that uh, we have like a kind of a community working on voluntary basis. And this has a very interesting part, but a lot of limitation in terms of time on dedicating uh, without financial resource. And then many times we, or myself, remind that it's like a, the 1% rule in internet participation, saying that the 1% of the users of a web page are creating the content and the other 19% are enjoying that. And this is not necessarily real, but it's like a kind of understanding the rhythm, the rhythm to uh, create like a kind of changing and understanding the rhythm of the people. One team is today, tomorrow is going to be another people, and many people that is joined um, supporting the network in a different ways. But this is uh, important to understand, especially when we are working on voluntary basis. And as a final uh, result of our work, we decide to create a model, a roadmap, reminded us that first governance is not really a model that is desirable to promote and there is more or less governance within the network. It means not because one, ne one network take a uh, decision in certain ways or have more bodies or instances to take decision at better to another is according to their needs or according to their complex or complexity or cultural context and so on. Uh, we as a recap network, we have a kind of light system of decision making, but we think it's working for the kind of network that we have nowadays. And as a part of the lessons learned, we create this a uh, roadmap to share with the community. This is coming from two exercises, the recap and the citizen science Amazon that Gina is, is here too. Uh, as part of this two process, we create like a kind of roadmap to facilitate ideally the work of another kind of citizen science networks. Here you can find a step, a step by a step of the question that we must ask when we are creating a, a network. Apart from that, there is a decision tree. And, okay, I will jump a little bit about this. And the important or interesting area is this. We identify as a, say, six areas in terms of governance that need to be addressed, not necessarily like a sequentially or at the same time, according to the needs of the network, that is operational structure, communication flows, participation model, financial sustainability, decision-making model, organizational approach. In each of these area, we organize all this list of questions that we were asking as a community and trying to solve each of them. You could find this information and a kind of a follow process to define the purpose and to select an area, choose options. And finally, 
a kind of decision tree to try to advise which are the best options for uh, your network. This roadmap is available uh, here in Zenodo. You could have the DOI. Uh, if you want to contribute or you have comments uh, or more than welcome, this is still under development. And this is, as I said, a result of our uh, experience with these two networks. I take advantage of this time to mention that we as a recap are uh, trying to consolidate or trying to join efforts with the network. Fortunately here, Karen and Natalia and other members are part of the recap. Uh, we still uh, would like to strengthen the ties with the Citizen Science Brazilian Network. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be here in this panel. Thank you, Karen, a lot. <laughs> Lots of less emerging, emerging practices learned here today. Uh, agora eu vou passar a palavra para Gina. Obrigada, Gina. Now I pass the floor to Gina. Gina, you have the floor. Good afternoon. So we change back a little bit to Portuguese and once again I, I would like to to thank the support of the translation so I can also convey my words in English so before uh, anything well first of all I would like to thank the the invitation to take part in this panel e sharing this panel with uh, Karen Jennifer and uh, Simone this presentation will take uh, about 20 minutes so and i have a lot of information and and i will try to share here and it is uh, and share my contact here my email here and youtube and if you want any information or you want to give any information you just get in touch i said i, I, I split my presentation into three parts so i have a general view about uh, the amazonian citizen network which is at the ictio experience that is a large scale experience with citizens in uh, regional scale in the amazon uh, basin and a local experience, an experience of community science carried out in Peru, in the Peruvian Amazon. So the citizen science network for the Amazon is a network based on citizen science mobilized to the conservation of the Amazon basin. Science, scientists and uh, Communities create uh, uh, approaches to the water basin, generating data and, and accessible and reliable information that are necessary and that guide decision making process. With the network, we try to democratize science, generate uh, knowledge based on citizen science, and help in the conser sustainable con uh, conservation of the Amazon basin. The spirit of the network stems for, of, from the notion that not only experts or scientists do science, but the population as a whole, if they are interested. So this network is guided uh, by innovative solutions that can be implemented in scale. And we start with pilot projects and our uh, base, uh, base ground is the collaboration uh, network, as Jennifer was saying before, and also cutting approaches when she uh, talks about governance. So the citizen science network is based on the integral view of uh, collaboration. You can see in our summaries. So we seek a, a integral a vision and in scale of the Amazon basin, diversity of knowledge, innovation, experimentation and learning, collaboration, localized opening, that is open data as much as possible. It's not 
any data. There are criteria for uh, opening this data. And respect to human rights and to local knowledge and culture. So this is a good opportunity to reiterate uh, my thanks to Karen Soacha, a person that was key to guide and help building the governance model for this network. The documentation about the experience and the prepar preparation of the governance plan is uh, available for the Brazilian network of citizen science. And we in the um, steering committee, we are willing to uh, share our experience with you. Still, about the network, these are the 25 or organizations that are associated in seven different countries that work together to uh, complement uh, studies in the Amazon basin. And any person, legal person or natural person can, uh, be, a, can be a member of the network. And I would like to highlight the Brazilian associations that are part of the network in Acre, Instituto Fronteras, in the Amazon, Amazonas Mamirawa Institute and the Federal University of Amazonas in Rodonia, Eco Floresta and the Federal University of Rondonia, and in Pará, Sapopemba, the uh, project Saúde and Alegria, Health and Joy, and uh, the, the movement of the fishers on the lower Amazon. We also have natural people associated to the network. Carolina, Carolina Doria from the Federal University of Rondonia and Sampo Pemba, they are part of the uh, steering committee. So to understand our origins, the network was born due to the invitation in, in a meeting uh, we had in April 2017, 17, WCF uh, invite organizations and governments to take part in this pilot project that was developing collaboratively a pilot project in citizen science in the Amazon, discussing uh, its development. So the, then the project uh, citizen science for the Amazon was born. And through this project, we wanted to create solutions to understand fishes migration, fish migration, and the factors that have an influence in this migration. And this information would be key to guarantee a sustainable management of fishery and preserve the, the water ecosystems in the Amazon. So at, after one and a half year of project with organizations from Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, and United States, France, and Peru, got together to empower people in the Amazon River Basin and collect information. Then, in 2017, we had a kickoff in this collaborative process to develop, on one hand, the ICTIO platform, which are the solutions that I will present, ICTIO is the result of the collaboration of different organizations among them, the Eco Floresta, Sapopemba, and Mam Mamirawa Institute that I mentioned before. ICTU kit, or field kit, which is a pilot project of a low cost system for water quality monitoring, and another uh, pilot project of, of community science implemented in elementary uh, schools in Peru. And as you can see here, ICTIO is a database about migra migrating fish from the Amazon uh, with collaboration of local uh, populations, uh, indigenous populations, individual fishers and uh, management groups, associations and scientists. So today my focus will be the experience of ICTIO and the experience community science. In this first phase of the project, we are talking 
uh, from uh, 2017 to 19, 15 pilot projects were implemented to support the development of the application ICTU to register uh, fishing efforts and to uh, implement the community science or citizen science in schools and water quality monitoring with the sensor system. So here in the map, you can see that this is a project that aims to integrate not only regions and organize, but organizations and people. So now I will uh, uh, elaborate more on ICTU and the project community science. But to talk about ICTU, I want to uh, touch the topic of fishery, which is one of the main resources for the Amazon region. And the introduction this introduction is key to understand why is ICTU relevant for the region. Because sometimes you don't have those who are from other regions in Brazil or, or the planet, sometimes they do not know the reality in the Amazon. So the Amazon River Basin has a, the, uh, the greatest uh, diversity of fishes in the planet with more than 1,400 species and one of the most significant in terms of fishing uh, production. So there we find some of the biggest species in the world that are also of key importance for uh, the, 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 as a staple for those who live in the Amazon. In this species, there is the uh, golden uh, river golden fish that travels more than a thousand kilometers. To give you an idea of what was that, is back and forth from uh, Peru uh, to to the to the estuary and back. And pirarucu fishy fish that can have three meters. Uh, long and 400 kilos. So there is a series of initi initiatives in the communities that help to understand the riverbank communities and develop actions to contribute to the conservation of aquatic ecosystems in the Amazon or water ecosystems. Very important contributions occur, especially in initiatives with these fishes and other local species in, lo in uh, local scale. The countries that uh, comprehend uh, or comprise the Amazon have, have to develop local dialogue with the traditional no local knowledge. And at the same time, we have uh, striking data with studies indicating that uh, freshwater migrating fishes are the most endangered species in the planet. They probably reduced. I'm sorry, I have a prob I'm having a problem with the transmission of Professor Leite. I'm sorry, we are having problems to receive Gina. Maybe it would be better if you turn off your camera. I believe we lost Gina. Let's wait just for a moment. Otherwise, we go to the other presentation and then she uh, come back. Let's wait for some sec. I'm back. I'm back. I'm sorry. It was drama pause. You, you can carry on. Well, I was talking about this striking uh, information of the the threat for ichthyofauna. 
let, let me recover just a second. We were talking about the challenges for fish management in the Amazon. You can see my presentation, is it? Yeah. Okay. So, there are three issues I would like to raise and to talk about ICTIO and our experience so far with ICTIO. First of all, that uh, participatory uh, raising and management usually are local. Mm, it, oftentimes, they are not connected among them. So within this network, we have a good, pos a, a great possibility of learning, not only with Brazil, but all the countries that comprise the Amazon. That the other point is that some migrating species are a, a very important fishing resource and the local management do not correspond to the management of fishes that migrate and depend on different areas. So local management is not enough. And there is the case of Dourada, the golden freshwater fish that migrates from the Andes, the Andean and the Peruvian Andes up to the delta of um, the Amazon. And the third point is that the, the size of the Amazon water basin and the high cost in logistics that is very complex is a major challenge to work in in a, in the in a scale in a proper scale and carry out research in a proper scale. The Citizen Science Network for the Amazon presents a solution for these three challenges that is exactly building a network of organizations and people to generating to generate information and learn more about fish and birds in the basin in large large scale using participatory approach and innovative technology of low cost this to say just to explain why we embarked in this major challenge of developing ICTIO together with uh, partner organizations. ICTIO is a, a database and a, a mobile app to register observation of fish uh, captured in the Amazon water basin. It gathers uh, records in the app current databases, historic data, uh, based on the uh, data existing data set. With that, we want to have information about prioritary species in the Amazon, contributing for a, a fish management and conservation of prioritary aquatic system ecosystems. Here you can see the app and the webpage ictio.com, where we can share database as well as download data to a certain level that uh, limits uh, sensible Inform, or sensitive information, for instance, where a certain person is working. With the results we have so far, in December 2020, ICTU had more than 20 lists with uh, records of more than 20,000 lists with fish registers, um, captured by the app and the, the platform, web platform. This is a work of more than 250 people and partners connected. And these data come from 149 uh, sub basins or tributaries. So we have in the screen, the main water basin, the Amazon water basin and the tributaries. With ICTIO, we already have information of 149 tributary basins. This map gathers information 
from uploads, which are the lists with phishing activities, as information sent by the mobile app. And here, to, for you to know where we have uh, records in the in the tributary basins that we see here in the numbers, the the basins in gray they don't have data, neither upload or app. And now I will give you the the map just considering the app, and you see that we still have a room for increasing the action with individual data collection. So these two maps reveal the fruit of the work of partner organizations that led the implementation of ICTU in, Brazil, in Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. And we uh, here talk about in the issue of engagement. And this chart helps us understanding the typology of the actions to present ICTU, uh, education activities or capacity building activities, uh, joint uh, data analysis. So here, what we have based on this, uh, the network, we, we support, we give technical support to some organizations uh, creating a forum for exchange of information so the or organizations can incorporate ICTU. Because some of these organizations organizations are, ha already have an active monitoring of fish uh, fishery. And here we have the types of actions carried out by the partners. And the uh, partners working in the field work in the field and work with organized uh, fisher communities or uh, individuals. So this activity really depends on the type of relationship that the partners already carry out with the, uh, the base communities or the grassroots community communities. This is a follow-up of the actions of, and the people that take part in this initiative. So, for instance, we have training, capacity building, and then we will have a space to share data, share and information, and um, evaluate, analyze together. So this is space. And the capacity, uh, and I'm sorry, the chart is in Spanish. So we have capacity building. Uh, the second item here, which is sharing using experiences, uh, previous consultation, which is another activity for uh, presenting the project and see if people are interested in and willing to take part in the project. So we have this uh, modes of action or activities that will depend on how the partners develop their work locally. So here we have one action that was extremely successful, which is the fisherman, fisher, fisherman, fisherwoman meetings in 2019 that are spaces for dialogue and exchange among people that are the most important in this uh, process, which are the, the fishing communities uh, and the, the, the fisher youth. So we have here pictures of meetings that took place in Brazil and in Peru. And what we really want is to foster the creation of a major uh, fisher com uh, community in the Amazon river basin. So we have uh, many examples of this engagement process. One of them, as I mentioned, we, where the partners lead the uh, process of engaging citizens, 
with training activities or capacity building and guaranteeing that the project is adapted to the desires and needs, educational level, gender, culture of the local people. So we don't have a, a standardized process. We don't have a standardized model for all the, co the different contexts. So in terms of interests of the stakeholders to be part in ICTIO, this vision that is part of something much greater that mobilizes people generating their interest. But we have uh, a great challenge ahead of us, which is uh, maintaining the interest of the citizens taking part. And this if, uh, uh, requires continuous efforts from uh, the uh, associ associated organizations and the network. The learned lessons are much related to this first stage from 17 to 19 because we are still in a pandemic process facing all the post, all the difficulties that this moment imposes on us. The first phase was dedicated to the technical development. And so problem solving and training was a challenge. And as we have, we don't have that much access to internet, WhatsApp, was the preferred means of communication for most of the, the participants. So emails is not the preferred. Many don't have access to internet. So uh, because uh, email is not the preferred um, channel although it is uh, an efficient method of information and communication. As for the participation of these people in the project, the organizations, the partner organizations, generally speaking, they, they had an approach in participatory uh, and financing their participation, and this is driven to guarantee that the participation is associated to a, a, a genuine interest. E isso realmente tem que ser administrado de forma cuidadosa para não gerar conflito dentro dos, de espaços comunitários, né? É, tudo bem que estamos, estamos bem de tempo, Natália? É, acabou o tempo, Gina. Mas... Ah! <risos> Foi muito, é muita informação. Não, tranquilo. Se quiser finalizar, só para a gente já deixar para a Simone. Tá bom. Mas aí uhum. depois a gente continua na discussão, sem problema. Tá bom. Então, é, eu vou só finalizar a questão das lições aprendidas do, do ICTU, que é, é curtinho. I'm going então, to conclude in terms of the lessons learned with ICTUs. In this first part of the project, we could not... Uh, the management team has assumed uh, the leadership in order to uh, strengthen uh, this process and the fisherman meeting was considered a very important space. The access to internet is a barrier that we try to overcome. And the pandemic represents a challenge for the continuation of the process in this context where we are. So I'm going to share with you two links and uh, something that I uh, was lost in, in the communication was that they distributed smartphones for uh, the communities being careful in order not to create conflict in the communities. 
So I'm going to distribute um, this uh, books. I'm sorry, uh, the time was short. And I want to share the systematization document of community science in schools. And there's a publication that uh, it's a publication that gathers together all of this experience that I wanted to bring to you. Thank you very much, Gina. We are going to have a moment for discussions after the break. So you will have time to uh, describe this experience in that. Now I pass the floor to Simone. Thank you, Natalia. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the organizers for the invitation. Let me share the screen with you. So first of all, I like to say that it's a pleasure to be here in this panel with women of different nationalities, very fierce women that are leading citizen science projects. For me, this is an excellent start to have these women in the leadership with active participation. I want to especially uh, thank those who are participating, those who registered, those who are watching uh, on YouTube, or those who have donated or dedicated hours of your day to be here. In my opinion, time is the most precious asset that we have, the most uh, precious is worth much more than money. So uh, when the person is about to die, do they want $1 million? No, they want more time. And we are here exactly discussing uh, practice to retain uh, citizen science, practice of engagement. So in the end, it's all about to convince people to donate their time, their free time, to engage with a cause that, in our case, is the scientific process to engage, get engaged in the production of scientific knowledge. Of course, that there are a number of uh, benefits related to that. It's not simply scientific benefits, but we need to convince these people to uh, donate their times. Nobody around the world has one second more than the other. You cannot buy your own time. So what we are discussing here is how to convince people that using their time for science, for citizen science, is really good. So that's what I wanted to bring today to our debate. And also, this issue of time, of uh, trying to get people time, is not true only for science. Nowadays, all sectors of the world, we are, are trying exactly to capture people's time and attention. Let me advance my slides. So science finally is in the race. For those who is are from Brazil, you know that we have a TV show where we have this horses in the jockey, and there's always the last horse in the race. And today, in this, this search for popular participation, science has just entered the race and is trying to run the track with citizen science. And this struggle for social mobilization comes from a social transformation, a transformation of society. It's not that research institutions that are saying, oh, let's open for our doors for society. Society is trying to come in. Society requires that, demands that things are done in a different way. The world is changing. We saw this very clearly in the pandemics. The way that we work has changed, especially in urban centers. The way in which we relate has changed. The way in which we consume, how we communicate, how we hold events. Look how we are having such an important event here today. So how does this social transformation, structural transformation, will not affect science, will not affect research uh, institutions? So I believe that citizen science is this arm that brings science to the race. And the modern citizen science, because citizen science started a long time ago, 
we have records in 1830 of a citizen science already. So this new citizen science driven by IT, ICT technologies, it puts science in this race for the social participation. And it's interesting because science develops new uh, communication and information technologies. Society is transformed by it. And society transforms science. So there is a reciprocal uh, construction relationship. And it, it has been like this since the beginning. But at some point, each part went to its own side. It seems that science is on one side in its castle and society is on the other side. This is also due to the professionalization of science, but also due to those uh, values, uh, due to those belief that knowledge is power. So the power is in the hands of those who have the knowledge. And today, the values of society have changed. The power is in the hands of those who can produce knowledge, share this knowledge, and make people use it. And from them on, that they are mobilized, that they can, are connected, that they create, that they activate this new power of society. So this new power is uh, not compatible with uh, traditional science. As Jennifer said, this is not to solve the complex problems of uh, today's society. Today, we need to engage much more people in order to be able to solve problems that before were solved simply by a group of people. That's not how it works today anymore. So today, I think that science is part of this race with a little bit of delay, but it's here. To st it's here to stay. And there is an advantage over the other, other sectors. The good news is that the uh, science research institutions and the researchers, they have an advantage, an advantage in this uh, struggle for social mobilization. So the question, the one million dollar question, is how to engage citizens, how to engage people, how to mobilize. This is the question that everybody wants to answer. There's no, not one single way. It's difficult because if we think of social medias, the algorithms are constantly changing. Those who thought that they understood social media yesterday, they don't understand today anymore. Society is in constant transformation. What worked yesterday won't work today. So this is a very difficult question to answer, how to engage citizens. But the advantage, and that I, I said that I think the science has, is that it has tools that helps us to answer to these questions. And these tools are on, are on the room next door. When we deal with natural sciences, the, uh, the answers are right next door on the building of social sciences. So within science itself, we have a lot of tools, uh, research, investigation, on how to engage people, how to understand the social transformation that we are living today. We are living a landslide of information with different demands for political engagement from the private sector, companies, campaigns, every day on our WhatsApp, TV and the radio, they bring like a landslide of demands for engagement. So it's very complex to know how it works, but if we have social sciences um, worked uh, with uh, uh, so social sciences are essential to rupture with traditional science and to enter with this new uh, science with, with a more participative model. Before anything else, I think that science needs to believe in science. 
the hard sciences that uh, we call the natural sciences, they need to believe in social sciences and they need to communicate. They need to learn from each other. So in my opinion, citizen science to be successful, first of all, it needs to open the doors for other scientific disciplines from other areas. So this would be a first step to be able to work in engagement with um, citizen science. I'm going to bring like three tips of projects where I worked in citizen science and also in the network that I uh, work, the Observatory of Forest Code. It's not a citizen science network, but environmental sciences working to create public policies. So I have some experiences in this area of engagement and I wanted to share with you. I'm sorry, my uh, voice uh, is a little bit... Uh, low, but I hope you can hear me. So the first tip would be a communication and engagement plan with the same technical and scientific rigor. So when we think of scientific methodology of the quality of data, data validation, we must think along the same lines with the same scientific rigor about the communication and engagement plan. It is essential. If we don't have a well-established, successful communication and engagement plan, we won't have a citizen project. We can have a scientific project, but not a participative science, uh, citizen science project. The second is to work with partners outside the circle of science. So let's um, go beyond this uh, area. To, if you engage someone and you bring someone that is idle, and if you engage this person to try start to perform the activity, this is a long, costly process that takes a long time. If the person is already engaged in activity, why not take the opportunity and to complement that with a citizen science project? I think this is one of the most successful formats of uh, the projects uh, that I have been seeing. If you establish a partnership with a school and suppose that they already have a, a curriculum activity, for example, if you they're going for a diving activity uh, and you can connect that with an environmental uh, citizen science project, so the most successful projects are where the organizations already had contact with the communities. So this partnership really helps. And number three is like make the best use of all the unfoldments of all the consequences of the project so we can keep this engagement and keep in uh, use the people who are already engaged in other projects sometimes have more benefits than in the original project itself i'm going to present to you a project that we executed and it brings a little uh, bit of the three components it was one of the most successful projects that we had where we started by thinking of a pilot project and it ended up having a great repercussion than we thought initially. It's a project called uh, Did You Drink Water? It was conducted in a state school in Rio Grande do Sul. It came from a school demand to raise awareness about the consumption of water using uh, disposable uh, glasses or uh, straws. So we advised them to investigate instead of simply giving a talk that they should investigate how was their consumption and that they debated on that. But as the project was in Rio Grande do Sul, in the south of Brazil, and we are in Rio de Janeiro, one thing is to go 
and for a talk and come back. The other thing is to execute from uh, far, from far away in a remote place. So we had this challenge. We set up a plan and a methodology for communication and engagement that was really well established. And we selected a group of students that could lead this project in the school itself with our guidance from far. We went to the school twice, one day to train this group of students and in the day of the project conclusion. This is a picture of the day that we went to train the students and the teachers, training them about the citizen science, the use of the project, the use of data collection tool, different forms of engagement, how to engage other students. We customized the platform that is called Fast Science for Crowd Science, developed by the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. To, and we use this for the classrooms. We set up a space in the school with a computer. It was a public school and not everybody had access to cell phones or internet outside the school. So we offered the possibility to do it in a hard copy and then inserting the data in the program through the school. We had to know the reality in order to develop this plan. And then we created guides and we oriented the students uh, remotely. They uh, organized engagement event. They engaged the other students. And the idea was that the classes would then go to their own communities and investigated how they consumed water. If they were using plastic uh, uh, cups or not. They had 60 students that were the citizen scientists, and they came back with 500 questionnaires filled in. In the end, we had this closing event. They were themselves, they presented the data set and the results, the outcomes. We had a reward system with the best performers per class, per student. So for those who participated in the uh, data collection, we had a student with a visual um, disability. So he had wanted to participate. So we adapted the questionnaire so he could fill in the data. So the press was there. It was much beyond what we originally expected. There was an unfolding here because then the project was also, it was done with high school students and then elementary students, they also wanted to participate. So they used the, the data from this data set to develop the project and the school was selected to participate in a national conference of youth for the environment. So until the end, when we thought, now it's over, then new things would come. Now the class wants to do this and they want to do that. So we must be prepared to respond to that. Because after you made such a huge engagement effort, you must be prepared for the unfoldings. Because if the project is, success is successful, you will have unfoldings. And then I will give you more three tips, but more related to the network from my experience of working with networks. First, the networks also need engagement. I think Jennifer and Karen already uh, talk, talked about that. We must have engagement within the network. Each organization will have its own dynamic. They have the rhythm. They have their own profile, one network. The network must understand that, and we must keep this network alive. So what we have done in the uh, network observatory of the forest code with 34 organizations for the forest code monitoring and helping in the construction of um, the forest code, two things that we've done. One was to identify the profile 
of the organizations of those who were participating of the network. This is extremely important. We can understand how everyone can contribute here. Everyone is contributing, as Karen said, that they are all contributing in a voluntary fashion. So we must understand how can everybody give their best without putting too much weight, because in the end, we don't want people uh, refusing to participate. So we want to understand the profile of each organization. This is extremely important. The other point that we did was to create a group of communicators because you have the technical groups, the thematic groups, but also you have the communicators within the organizations. When we have a demand for a campaign or when we want to promote something, the communicators are all active there. And then we know how each communicator can help. Sometimes the organization works more with press assistants, the other other times they can help with their communicator in the area of design. So to understand what is easier for each one will help. Collective actions and networks need leadership and governance. It's true. It has already been said and it's true. And I can confirm because I have to participated of two beautiful environmental collective actions with huge potential, with wonderful people, and with a huge effort and dedication, and that did not take off because of lack of governance, lack of rules, lack of knowing what each one should do, how each one could help. So it was excellent collective actions with very good people. Each one ha could contribute as they wanted, but this lack of governance made it um, all um, drain away. So good governance is essential for a long-lasting network. And my last tip, and then I learned this uh, in my work with networks, thinking that the citizen science network that is starting now wishes to promote uh, citizen science in Brazil. How much are we willing to uh, give up to for the cause? How much are we willing to let our egos go to let go everything that we represent for the cause. The campaigns of the first code observatory, in, the, in these campaigns now we have a practice. We don't use uh, log, trademarks or logotypes anymore. These are two campaigns that we uh, organize. This is all for the cause. And this campaign of the all was to uh, stop a, provisor, a prov provisional measure that would change our forest code. If we put our logotype, our brand, the uh, member organizations would share. Uh, not all of them. We have 74 organizations. Some of them cannot share, for example, from our uh, social media. If we have, if they have a logotype, but let's suppose that twenty something, twenty um, partners would share. But we wanted to everybody to participate. We want, we needed uh, the participation of all of them. So the idea is that they can all share without any problem. You don't even need to mention the the source. You don't need to say that it comes from the observatory. So we created a, some cards. You have this one with the all, but there were others so that they could identify more with different uh, cards. You had the own, you had a person or, an, or other animals, but the organization could then share. And we didn't need to them to code them. No, you don't need to even to mention us. Go, just share. It's also an, another campaign that we created, like it's enough human beings. And also we created the different arts without a logotype. They, so they could use freely on the day that they wanted, because when we want to 
uh, promote a cause in a campaign, in, in, as in this case, we must let go, you know? And you cannot have rigid rules. You cannot post on these days or at that time and like quoting or mentioning the authorship. No, please, let's just share. So my last tip, thinking of this network, if I was going to, if I have to choose between the brand and the cause, I choose the cause. Thank you. Thank you, Simone, for the excellent presentations. All the presentations were great. Now we are going to have a quick break of two minutes and we'll be back for the questions because we um, went a little bit over our time, but uh, in two minutes we'll be back. Now we will have a Q&A session. We have a series of very interesting questions, and I will try to summarize some of them. So if you can uh, open your cameras, we will start the discussion. There is a question right in the beginning made by Jennifer. Uh, to Jennifer and all uh, speakers, the issue of uh, the diversity of concepts for citizen science, the diversity of motivations and diversity of interests related to engagement in citizen science. So there are three questions that are about uh, related to this topic. One of them is by Liliani that asks, what do you think of the importance of raising, uh, surveying the motivations and interests right in the beginning of projects? And also, there is a question by Tatiani about the, the rotulation or the labeling, uh, some initiatives can be labeled as citizen science when they are actually initiatives that do not promote participation. Public participation in the scientific processes. So I open the floor to the four of you about the importance of evaluating motivation and interests and the issue of the use of the term citizen science. De repente, eu poderia começar eh, sobre essa questão do questionário. I believe I can start. Uh, a questionnaire is an important instrument to have a baseline and start understanding the profiles and interests of uh, the community. But it is not... Uh, uh, an instrument uh, to create baseline. They can, it can also offer a space to feedback to the process, not only the baseline, but also to, for the improvement of the process, helping uh, to guide an initiative, aiming also to, to learn, to have a hearing space to an uh, active listening, to understand the interests of participants. So we have a good experience of having surveys or, or questionnaires that are less structured and they are more open to the public in general. So it allows us to have a better understanding, to learn better what our audience wants. Gina, I, I agree, and I think sometimes it can be as easy as talking to people and, and knowing. It doesn't have to be as formal as a survey, but if you have a very big audience, a survey can help. Yeah, <laughs> um, and knowing, I think that there are, historically, there have been um, projects in this field that have started, to, especially to collect big data, without recognizing why people would participate. And you have to start there. I mean, yes, it starts with the reason for doing 
the project, but part of, and part of that reason is the science. There are data and studies that um, the motivations that people bring to this and the reason that they think it is worth their time to participate is because they are doing something that is bigger than themselves. This is, this is a worthwhile use of my time. I am making a change. I am making a contribution. And so if the science isn't there or the, the reason for the science, it doesn't have to be a published paper, but it has to be something that is real that is coming out of this. If that real thing isn't there, it doesn't matter if someone loves birds or, uh, <laughs> you know, is, is interested um, that that meaning has to be there. Um, and, and then, yes, you have to understand what people are capable of doing, what they're willing to do, what they're interested in doing, and what support they need to do that as well. So these conversations, whether it's a, 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 an actual conversation face-to-face -face or a broad survey, are really going to save so much time and investment in the long run. Um, I, Ms. Holly, I'll stop there because others, there were two questions and I can talk about terms too, but others might want to talk about motivations. I just want to add maybe a different aspect and it's really, I believe that uh, understanding motivation is really taking care of the community. You know, it's, uh, it's really uh, be aware of with whom we are working with and what are they expecting? And really, we need to be very creative in the ways that we are understanding. I have to confess that every day I'm a very, if I'm, I, I am in a project of citizen science, uh, I have to confess that surveys still for me is like uh, trying to find alternative ways. One, or maybe talking to the people, as Gina mentioned, maybe more open conversation, closer to the people if, you if we have a small project, or search for alternative automatic ways to understand the people's motivation through the forum, through the social network, through the other, uh, I don't know, environments where they are interacting and where they don't need to, to we don't need to sometimes overload the people too understanding them using service. You know, we have nowadays a lot of channels where people in citizen science are talking, forum validating information, social networks, and people are very active. And I think that as a citizen science community, we need to start to use these alternative ways to understand better our big picture. But obviously technology never is going to replace the way to connect with people. You know, if we have the opportunity to really talk with the people and we really uh, engage between scientists or different stakeholders, policymakers or whatever, and understanding the motivation of all of them as a humans, I think always my, will be the best. But it's quite difficult sometimes, depending on the scale of the project. Para uh, complementar. Uh, what should Just I to add, I believe that the issue of motivation and how to survey and uh, that and how to know your audience depend a lot on the type of project. And these projects in citizen science are very different one from each other. We have uh, projects with huge audiences with major technology and we have small projects with small communities. So the way to approach is the first of all, you have to know your audience, how to do it, how, what is the tool, if it is a form, if it is a, 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 um, a hearing or a technological survey with algorithms depends on the project. So we have to understand the project, we have to understand how this audience or what is the audience for this project and then start to seek and raise information to develop a good planning for mobilization and engagement. Very good. So thinking now about the, the purpose of sits in science, there's a question by Professor Brendina in your science action. Do you think science is a common uh, um, good, a common that uh, serves to, to drive uh, 
public policies or decision making process how do you see the what is the role of science for society what is the relationship between science and society i don't know if karen or jennifer would like to start well the commitment we have with scientific production is above all a commitment with the responsibility and validation of the experience of generating reliable information, reliable knowledge. This is a fundamental principle. And this is a guiding principle in these actions because if you generate information that is not reliable, you already start wrong. So the exercise is disseminating this vision and guaranteeing the scientific processes of questioning, of data collection, data analysis and review. And in this sense, data collection is key and having open science so we can have more people with access to information, more people with access to the protocols and procedures, and they can improve the process and validate the process. And a key issue is also bringing science as part of life, as, as a principle, because the lack of science give uh, room to lies, to fake, fake news. It's also important because we create uh, uh, critical thinking with that. So these waves of uh, seeds and science also have this role of uh, building critical thinking, curious thinking for the audience, for the society as a whole. You know, I, I would add, and thank you, I am also looking at a question that's in the chat here about the misalignment between science and the problems of communities, particularly locally, and whether scientific endeavors can or often are colonial or extractive in terms of knowledge and contributions. And that's a, that is absolutely a real concern. And I think when we, if we think about science and the role of science in making decisions and very complex decisions, and this is the kind of conversation that, that excites me, um, and not because I have a lot of answers, but because I think there are very rich conversations to have here. If we are thinking about decisions and science informing decisions, that idea of reliability may look very different depending on who you ask. And so the potential of citizen science, community science, collaborative science is to really be um, working together to identify that problem, to identify potential solutions and identify the understandings, the data, um, the monitoring that can be done together to inform change. And the uncertainties can be part of what is really important to identify in order to help that process really speak to everyone who is involved about why they're doing something um, and whose um, knowledges and whose needs are being prioritized. Uh, because there is very much that risk when things are driven particularly by um, scientific institutions um, presuming that science will solve something or even that science can, can help in a way, if that process doesn't listen to, reflect, engage, and support, equitably support the communities who are um, intimately affected by that process and the data, um, it is going to um, create more problems, it is going to cause more mistrust of science, and it is very likely not going to 
um, make the change that even those of us who come from academia might hope that we can affect. And I think that is something that we all need to be very mindful of and, and reflective of when we come to this process. And I've talked to scientists. My dissertation work uh, was with scientists trying to use citizen science and effectively using citizen science to make change. And in many fields, like conservation biology, the area I work in, scientists want to help. They want to make change. And they assume that science is the way to do that because that's the tool that we have. <laughs> but it's many times a tool that we can use, but have to use very carefully. Uh, yes, I would like to connect uh, what Jennifer was saying with the first question that Natalia asked about the use of the term of citizen science our opinion about that. And I think it's very connected with the second question about the science as a common good. And for me, and I think not just for me, it's a big discussion across the global citizen science communities. What is citizen science? And Jennifer was using three expressions with citizen science, community science, collaborative science. And this is an, uh, a good indicator of what is happening nowadays. You know, all of us, we are using different expressions. We are recognizing the diversity of the term. Uh, we are recognizing that some of us identify citizen science as a kind of umbrella for uh, calling the collaboration between scientists and different stakeholders of the society. But I think the most important part that we identify as a citizen science is this collaboration is looking for a common good and according to, definitely, I think that this is an important point with the uh, participation of public or the participation in uh, different stakeholders in science, is that we are looking for a really common good together. And what is a common good? This is a good question. You know, the common good is not by definition, it depends on the project, depends on the context, depends on the cultural uh, context. As, as many people, as many vision, as many stakeholders, as, as many voices we have involved, better construction we will have about what is a common good for us and what is this science heading to and what is helping, how is helping to solve this problem. That's why I really believe that if we want to call citizen science, and recently I think the exercise of the European Citizen Science Association and their community about characteristics of citizen science are helping a lot in this discussion about, okay, maybe we don't want to um, create like a standard definition of citizen science, or yes, we are nowadays, I think that every time we are more open and open, this umbrella is very big nowadays. But uh, I think that in each project, we need to uh, identify a set of principles and create our own definition in our context about what is the citizen science in this context for us. And this is very challenging because, um, for instance, I, saw, I read something in the chat that sometimes or we call citizen science project and we are not really being open to participation. And then we said, what are we using? Are we using an attack or a strategy just to call something that nowadays is becoming quite trendy? And then that is that is very important point. And it's really to say, what does it mean in our context? Whatever, participatory science, citizen science, community science, extreme citizen science, what, what, what are the characteristics that uh, we are follow and how our results and our governance model are responding to that? I, I, I think. Karen, I, I would like to just add, and thank you for that. Um, we should think about why the, the, the cases when a definition is important. So when you want to, so I look at, at two extremes. One is in my work, building an association. I want to invite and engage anyone who is interested in these practices to come together, no matter what they call their work, if they are interested in this field, there is value in having a conversation um, and learning together and sharing ideas. And so for the work that I do as an association, I try to use a very broad term and, and not be restrictive. However, there are cases when, if you're doing something that is very specific, um, 
it's important to have a definition to say when when we, for example, um, in in our or, in an organization when we talk about citizen science that meets our brand or our criteria, we mean this. Um, and it gets it gets muddy and complicated when different people define it different ways. And I think we will have to come to some consensus around terms, um, but we should also be thinking about about why. And I, and I, I agree with everything that you're saying, just adding that dimension to it. How interesting it is. Thank you. É, vou aproveitar e complementar também sobre a questão de definição. O que eu acho que quando a gente está no momento de começar algo novo, como é o caso da ciência cidadã... About this question or definition, when we are starting something new, as it is the case now that we have with the term sustainability, for example, when you are starting something, the more strict the definition, the more difficult it, it is to get engagement. So we are living this process. We are living in this discovery process of bringing more people. So it's normal to have different definitions. And certainly at some point we'll reach one single definition as today everybody, for example, understands sustainability. It's a broad term. It's a term that nobody can say, well, I am against sustainability. Nobody's against the uh, sustainability. And I hope we reach a term for citizen science that nobody will be against it. It's for the common good, the common good of society. But there's this process of uh, construction. I'm sorry, she froze. She froze and froze. <laughs> Definitely. Well, what she's saying, what she said, that at some point, at some year, in some years from now, we will look behind, look to the past. Well, I would just like to add a point, and now it's Gina speaking, that at some point, are you back, Simone? Simone, would you like to conclude? I think she, Simone froze again. Gina, you can go. I think that uh, Simone has a connection problem. But anyway, the discussions of these labels and terms is recurrent in our meetings of citizen science, and for sure they will remain for a while at least. One point that we need to consider is not like a fight, it's not like a dispute to be exactly the same and to have a, a uniformity in the concept. I just understand that we have a broad concept that accepts the differences of different expressions. So you can say, okay, we look alike and we understand that we accept that we work in different ways because we have different objectives and strategies. But this not put us apart. This give us, gives us the possibility of looking at different experiences and learning from them and adjusting our initiatives. So I think that this struggle to have one common concept is important, but at the same time understanding that this common concept will then embrace divergences as well. And it's okay. And thinking of this relationship of the strategies and the uses of the term and the engagement, you mentioned in your presentations the authentic engagement, the truth engagement of encouraging people, in fact, to have their interests, they have their interests satisfied by the participation that they are invited to have, or participation in the creation of the proposals. So I will ask you to answer to this question of Filippi, came from Filippi. What do we think of the manipulation or persuasion as an engagement strategy? 
It's what we call extrinsic motivation, the use of a strategy to convince people to join a project. This would be a first part of the question. The other point that came also about uh, the mot motivation in networks was the use of uh, working groups where people uh, identify with the group and with that they are able to engage more with the activities of this network. Please, can you tell us more about your experience, your experience, the use of working groups to encourage participation? I'm sorry, with the working groups. I'm sorry, what working groups? It's not clear to me. Well, Jennifer and Karen mentioned that their ne the networks where they are, they have working groups. So maybe it's more directed to them. And about genuine engagement, I think that anyone could, could, uh, could answer to that. All of you can answer. I will... Uh, make a, like a brief comment on that. I think that in terms of uh, citizen science and motivation, there is a, a counter argument that we must keep in mind, thinking in rural, about rural areas and urban areas. In the rural areas, the reality may be similar to context to Europe, to United States, to Australia, because it's it has to do with this um, dream-like time. You have an onerical time. You have free time, and you will engage with initiative to learn, to connect to other people, to be part of a group, to produce science. So you have this onerical com component in the process and the learning itself. But the reality that we have in, in Brazil and in other countries, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, is that there are projects that today we can call, that we can call citizen science, considering this broader scope, but they are very much um, driven to the management of natural resources. So the motivation is completely different than this first case. Uh, when we are talking of a metropolis, of a big city, we are talking of how to manage a resource that is essential for uh, people's survival. And there is another argument that is important as well that when you have individuals participating in a city and in a cross cooperation in rural areas, we would have a trend to have the participation of groups. So the strategy of engagement and participation is focused in a group, in the social group. So I think that these are the differences that we must keep in mind to discuss the motivation. That's my comment. So motivations, I, there is, uh, you know, a concept. In my talk, I, I mentioned that there we can have very simple engagement in science or very deep engagement in science. And I think the risk of that is to assume that deeper is better. But, but it can be in some situations. There is also a concept of, uh, an academic concept of the tyranny of participation, of expecting that more participation is better and therefore expecting that people should give more and should be involved more deeply. Um, and that can be an imposition in certain circumstances. And so I think these um, engagement mechanisms uh, need to be gauged very carefully um, and where this co-creation and the deep involvement is coming from and where it is most effective is not so much someone coming from academia and saying, we want you to do all of this. Instead, it is more from the community saying, we own this. This is our question. 
These are our priorities. This is what we want to see happen. And we are inviting you to be a partner with us in making this happen. Um, so that I think should be, should be very um, held in check. I was uh, waiting for Karen to speak, but let's go. About this issue of the manipulation to engage, the term to manipulate means that you mobilize, convince someone to do things, for or you for your own good when you manipulate someone you are asking the person to do something for your own interest the concept of citizen science in its own does not include that because the benefit it's not for the research institutions not for the researchers citizen science brings benefit for the environment conservancy for the citizens for those who participate a number of different actors will receive this benefit. So when you are engaging for the, the citizen to participate in a project that for sure will bring all of these benefits, you are not manipulating because it's not your own interest. Well, my interest may be to generate profits. If my interest is to generate um, environmental conservancy, it does not belong to me. It be belongs to everyone. So this is the difference between to manipulate in the engagement or not. If we are bringing people to participate in citizen science for environmental benefits, for example, to solve a complex problem in the coastal uh, line, for example, it's not for your own interests. You can find everywhere people People, of course, that deceive other people, including in the area of different sciences, anywhere in society you have that. But in itself, the definition of a citizen science engagement, it, 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 they don't match, doesn't match with manipulation because citizen science will bring this greater benefits, which will, can be like an environmental benefit for all or a scientific benefits for the common good. I agree. And I think that the, the question that was raised is exactly in the sense of this initial engagement. When you call someone's attention for to something, even if they don't understand initially that that is interesting. So the manipulation uh, is uh, could be like a strategy, a social psychological strategy to raise someone's awareness for something. From what I understand of the question, this is the idea behind it. Linking that with another question about the maintenance of this motivation in the long term. So you have the initial engagement that you invite people initially, but how do you keep that in the long term? In order to, I don't want to forget that question about the working groups, okay? But I'm trying to connect the questions, and this came to my mind also. The initial motivation and the motivation in the long term to keep people engaged for a long time. I, I really would like to add something in that point. I was listening to Simone, and I, I agree with her that initially our citizen science, most of our citizen science projects are based on a common good and our high ethical principles. Uh, I think that in some point we need just not to forget a little bit the citizen science in the health area and a lot of conflicts and ethical challenges that uh, has been in this. In this maybe it's not our most of our experience because most of us are, are coming from the environmental and biology area, but citizen science in the health area is a very important point. And I think that manipulation in this context is something that we need to be aware of. And then my second point, and it's related to Natalia. Yes, I think that we need to start to open this discussion as an ethical challenge in terms of using some strategies to keep engaged people using gamification or another things to 
I don't want to use the, the word manipulate because I think it's a very strong word. But in some ways, trying to use these uh, actions to get the our participants very into something, into a program, into platform. And we need to keep an eye open in these ethical challenges. Because yes, we need to trigger the participation on the, of the people, but until which point is going to be um, ethical to do that in the name of conservation or whatever, you know, this is this is still this is still in in our in our need to be in our view. And the second question is um, related to the working groups. I think that maybe this is a very specific question. And in terms of recap, we decide to create a governance model based essentially in two working groups. And initially, governance that it was uh, this group discussing how do we create these rules. Once we finish this process on to have an, an initial set of agreements, we finish this group and we keep two working groups, the management group and the communication working group is uh, mainly conformed by voluntary people, um, you know, just to be conscious that this is the way to keep the network alive for a while. And conscious that uh, in a, I don't know, maybe one year or a, in a short time, we want to really move on and invite other people to be part of that. But until now, have been the more horizontal uh, way to work, really, because all of us, we don't have like a kind of representative within the working group. For instance, if we need to take decision, all of us, we are discussing, we are 10 in one group and five or six, I think, Gina because Gina is, I am part of one group and Gina is part of the other group. Um, we need, uh, we, we try to be as horizontal as we can. Sometimes it's very useful. Sometimes when you need to be very executive is more complicated, but I, in general terms, I think working groups have been a very good strategy for, for, for us. Gina, did you want to comment on your experience? It's a really uh, Quickly, because uh, the, we have the citizen science for the Amazon network, and so we have the the, the steering committee. That's one of the groups, and the collaboration groups are also uh, the way to uh, um, develop the the work of the network. How we implement the, the strategy. And it's also voluntary, so different organizations are part of the group. The fish working group, for example, it has like uh, 17, 19 members. And we have monthly meetings and they uh, inform the development of strategies for each group, for example, for, uh, for the, the technical development and also communication engagement. So it's uh, we, have, we have five collaboration groups within the network. I can say from uh, the, the CSA side, I would be happy to share the lessons learned and the lessons we continue to learn about working groups as part of an association. We have learned some things the hard way. I, I will also say that the working groups are some of the most valuable um, spaces for elevating leadership, um, emerging ideas, advancing work. Um, but it's, you know, it's not easy. I, I, I would also add that uh, to bring these two questions, Natalia, together, that what I, my general <laughs> thoughts related to working groups and also to the retention of citizen science participants is overall just thinking throughout every element um, that people are doing these things on a volunteer basis, that they need to feel valued, <laughs> that their work is meaningful and that it, it is contributing to a bigger picture that everybody is working on together. And I think that holds for both of those questions. Perfect. And this thing of acknowledgement, its recognition is very much, was very much mentioned by all of you. And the questions about this, the impact, the feedback on the impact was mentioned as well. And it's good to give this feedback to the participants 
I don't know, uh, I don't remember who talked about these initiatives, but how do you evaluate your projects, this issue of the impact? How do the citizen uh, researchers see the use of it? How do they know that the data is being used to change the reality? And also, there's a question about data, specifically about data, the open data that is produced by the citizen researchers in partnership with researchers and the issue of publications, if they are open and the results of this data being shared with society in general. So I would like to have comments on these two aspects, the uh, return that they have and the attribution, the acknowledgement that they should have in the project and also the publication of the results. If you can comment in general about your experiences in this aspect, because some questions uh, came to us. Who pays for an open publication, for example? In Brazil, we find it very difficult to pay to publish in uh, for open publications, whereas in other countries, maybe this is easier. I don't know. So I ask you to please comment on that. I, may I comment about the experience we have our community science in Puno, in Peru? So we developed an educational mod, uh, module for uh, middle school or high school. So the students have a plan, a project plan for in, of investigation or research for the community. As I, I presented you, ICTIO is a large scale plan where the first question come from the academia, from science. So we seek an object that is an object of interest of people so we can mobilize because the the backdrop is the migration the fish, the long scale uh, large scale migration of fish but and there's this uh, there's experience of a community science education in peru the students or the better saying the teachers had an orientation and uh, researchers worked in partnership with teachers to support uh, the formulation of questions and see what protocols and methodologies would be proper to answer that question. So we work with three schools, uh, uh, four schools, three decided to work with water quality and uh, fourth with coffee to generate data, but one of the res most interesting results was uh, carrying out a science fair to show the results and call the attention for local authorities uh, to the problems raised by the, the students. So this approach uh, raised the interest of uh, youth for research, thinking on research based on the results achieved. With this experience, the, the experience was generally guided by the experience of, of uh, the youth there. So we have this process. And at the end, we had this science fair with the presence of authorities to see the results of their investigation that usually do not have a voice. So it was empowering and transformative, this process. In addition to having scientists following up the process, we also have a, a communication team supporting the youth to transform these results in a product. So this experience, I know that we always think on papers, publications, and reports as a result. But this experience didn't have time to generate uh, quality data for a publication. We have data, but we needed still to imp to to, um, to work them 
when we have uh, data production as an object. But the objective, it was to raise interest for science and generate questions. And on the end of the day, it was an experience that raised the interest of educational authorities in Peru that want to uh, replicate the experience in other schools. And this strengthens uh, a cha change in perspective of the, the very educational system. So uh, teachers have more autonomy to adjust their syllabus and their curriculum and respond to uh, uh, questions for, from the community, from the society. But to have the, con uh, it was a, a very good experience, but to have a continuity, we need uh, um, support because it can be, can't be just in one school. To have an impact with the initiative, we have to work in a more robust network of schools. Um, <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> May I? <laughs> well, considering the, the benefits for the scientist citizens depend a lot on the level of engagement. Depend, well, there, there are projects that you go there, take a snapshot and go away. There are projects as the one we I, I, pre I presented, have you drink water, that you are engaged for months. So the direct benefit for the citizen scientists is uh, related to the level of engagement with the project. So the more they engage, the higher the level of the benefits. This, uh, this project with the schools in the South, the, the boy that represented the school in the National Conference of Youth didn't even have an ID card. He was, he got his ID card for the, the project. So sometimes it goes much beyond than just engagement in the process and all, all these things have to be taken into consideration. Very nice. Uh, we are getting to our running almost running out of time but i have a question by eduardo about publications uh, publishing paper uh, open data open publication and that it is important to have journals as uh, uh, citizen science steering and practice it is important to have uh, journals focused on uh, citizen science to publish these papers and in our case in Brazil, that publish in our language because we have a culture, and, and I believe it is not only Brazil, but uh, Latin American countries in general, we have to translate our papers into English so we can be, uh, we can have a greater impact. And, uh, th but these papers end up not being available for common people. The access is more, more restrict. So I would like you to, to comment uh, the publication in, uh, in journals, specific journals. I, I do believe that we need to, okay, I think the open access community, we want to call like that, that has been an initiative that very long term, and I, especially in Brazil and other parts of the, of the Ibero-American region have been working a lot on that. And we need, as a citizen science community, open to that. You know, the traditional way to publish in journals is still very connected to the traditional way of evaluating the research performance. And that's the point. It means one way, the easy way to say that is, uh, yes, we need to plan money from the beginning of a project to pay for an open, for the open, you know, the gold route of publication and to have in a journal with high impact open access. But this is a quite far reality from developing countries like ours, you know, and, and we need to move forward in that way. And I think that the initiative nowadays for really thinking repositories uh, available in the universities to connect this with the research evaluation of the, the performance evaluation of the researchers and move you know, a little bit away from the traditional way of publishing and measuring, especially in citizen science community, is very important. Because, um, and, and especially thinking in the diversity of languages too. I totally agree with you, Natalia. Uh, 
we need to confess that most of us, we are publishing just in English. This is a creating a limitation, especially with local communities to the access. But it's not just the language. In terms of the language itself, it's the way that we communicate our results. That is just not, you can't translate this in, in a proper Spanish or, or Portuguese, but it's still quite complicated, even for us in the within the community, you know, to understand many of the results of the of the things and science. I think that we have a very long, uh, a very interesting challenge to address that and to work with the open access community to really think how citizen science can overcome this and make available the results. I really think that in general, all kind of projects of citizen science must ideally have a plan of evaluation of impact. You know, as Simone mentioned, it depends of the of the turn of the project, but always you are planning an impact. You know, then you need to plan that from the beginning and decide how are you going to measure that. Wherever you say my measure of impact is, uh, how much awareness I can raise from the people measuring from the, I don't know, their opinion in one topic at the beginning and their opinion in another topic at the end. This is, you know, it depends on each project, but I think a, a plan of evaluation of impact in each uh, citizen science project is very important. Karen, thanks so much for the insights regarding um, the challenges of multiple languages and not just languages, but approaches to uh, publishing. I know one thing, being the home of the journal Citizen Science Theory and Practice, um, we are having active com conversations about different, different publishing models um, because just like citizen science challenges some of the traditions of academic science, we need to similarly be challenging the traditions of <laughs> academic publishing. It's not, it's not easy. And there are good reasons to have some of the elements of the publishing standards that academia has modeled, such as peer review. But we also need, we actually just submitted a, a grant proposal to broaden peer review to include people who are outside of academia and provide the scaffolding and structures. Because ultimately what we hope to produce is something that uh, one of you um, used the term earlier on today of um, proven practices. How do, we prove, how do we prove practices if we don't have some level of peer review? So how do we take the best of these traditions of knowledge building and, and manipulate them in ways that honor the um, importance of building reliable knowledge, but break down some of the traditions that have restricted um, who can be part of that process. Um, and I will absolutely agree, I think I may have frozen. <laughs> We are listening. We are listening. Okay. We now. hear you. We hear you. Yeah. <laughs> now is now is present. Let's get out for key. Oh. Okay. Oh no. <laughs> que pena. Uh, well, espero que a gente. For a pity, I hope Jennifer is able to go to come back. If you want to make any final comments. I, well, I believe we uh, we passed time. I'm, but I'm very uh, excited with all the discussion. But so, but I will give you some moments for final words. I open the floor for your comments for a final comments, and I thank this discussion that was excellent. I hope we can continue it in another moment. Gina, if you want to start, I would like to, to thank, because this is a, a, a very uh, valuable space for discussion. And above all, I would like to congratulate you for the organization of this meeting. It's extremely important, and it is extremely relevant to have an international perspective as we have here 
learning with other organizations that are there in this uh, path for a longer time. And it is a space for learning. There's a lot of people willing to collaborate with the Brazilian network of citizen science. And it's important to find connections and su uh, support. So I'd like to thank, it is always uh, a satisfaction sharing this space with Natalia, Karen, Simone, and Jennifer. It is very valuable in addition to our presentations, value the space for debate. Thank you, Gina. Jennifer, if you want to give. Uh, Karen. Okay, I joined with the Gina's uh, acknowledge. Really, I enjoy a lot of the talks. Maybe my final words would be to invite our networks to really create create like a kind of working groups or maybe community of practice or just for not being very ambitious <laughs> and to at least create the spaces to discuss that from the within the citizen science community. I think that for instance Jennifer uh idea that they are running from the Citizen Science Association is amazing. You know how to test and how to create a small project to prove that there are alternative ways to do things within citizen science. Then I think that this is a and I am happy that for instance see a lot of participation here and that we can create these spaces uh, within the, the Citizen Science Brazilian Network and RECAP are obviously connected with the rest of the Citizen Science Association because uh, it's something that I like nowadays too much is we can see nowadays us as a citizen science community that we have our you know local challenges, but really we have a very big umbrella connected uh, connected us. Then thank you so much, Natalia, and all the organizers for being here. And it was a pleasure to be with Gina, Simone, and Jennifer and share this space. Obrigada, Karen. Uh, Simone. Thank you, Karen. Simone? I would also like to thank, thank the questions and say that we do not have all the answers, but a lot of interesting things were raised in this discussion. We could be here for months discussing the definitions of science, uh, citizen science, what is engagement, what is the level to avoid uh, becoming manipulation, uh, opening data. These are all issues that we could be discussing for months. So it's, I hope we can promote more events such as this one so we can debate more, especially here in Brazil, because the movement is just taking off, starting with the network. So congratulations and thank to everyone that took part. The questions are amazing. The answers, we have to seek for them together. Jennifer. Your, uh, your thought <laughs> that you began earlier and your final thoughts, please. Thank you. I, you know, it's it's okay. And sometimes the internet can do everyone a favor by uh, <laughs> limiting long conversations. Um, but it's it's been a real honor to be here. I, if I were to say one thing to tie to the last comment that got cut off is that I think that as associations and networks, we can be stronger if we build together the platforms that we each have to um, not reinvent the wheel. And so I would love to continue conversations, for example, about what can be done with an existing journal to grow, to accommodate and better reflect the richness of this field. Um, so we are stronger as we unite our knowledge together, and I hope that we can continue to build on these collaborations across networks and across associations. Maravilhoso. Muito obrigada pela participação de todas vocês. Espero que... Wonderful. Thank you for the participation of you all. And I really hope that in other moments we can continue this conversation of building our network practices together. I always see the examples of projects and 
of a CSA, for instance, and we bring this for our experience. And this is key, build together and avoid reinventing the wheel. So I will close from here and I invite you all to, to uh, continue. We will have a closing debate, but I understand if you cannot, but you're invited to stay if you want. And I will ask you to uh, remain for a little a while with the, the cameras open, everybody now, so we can take a, a picture and have and register this very special moment. So, bye bye. Smile. Thank you very, very much. And now we will have another two minute break and we resume. Thank you. So, we are in the closing phase of this event. In this closing session, we are going to answer to some questions that were asked during the event about the network. And if you have any other questions, you can send them through the chat box so we can answer as much as possible. I ask the help of our colleagues. And we are going to try to answer to these questions. There is a question by Ana Dalia Vieira Sina. She would like to know what to do to participate of the Brazilian network of citizen science. And probably, Ana, we will open, we will publish a form, now a website where you can fill in the form. Agreeing to some points about our values, principles, and our operations. And with relevant data to formalize your participation in the network. So we ask you, to you and the other ones that are interested in participating in the network, we ask you to wait for a little while until this form is available and we are going to publish in our um, networks. And we will then um, announce when we have this form available. Natalia asks, is it possible to participate of the Brazilian network of citizen science or other projects, for example, uh, citizen... Uh, researchers as a participating member? If yes, how do I do? This is an important question. The network has the mission of give visibility to existing projects, but also you have the platform and projects of citizen science in Brazil, where you can, that, that you can obtain more information directly uh, from the website of these uh, projects, and you can also contact the project coordinators so you can work as a participant. For example, the project sits on uh, researchers from Savi. They hold regular events. They have engagement events so that people get to know the project and may participate. So I suggest during the event, we... Um, saw several projects with the contacts, so the best thing would be to, to contact the coordinators. And of course, this network can also work as a bridge to these projects. We give them visibility. So if you want to work as a participant, it's important to talk directly with the coordinator. There are some contacts that we have already published on the website of project coordinators that already participate of the network. So you can look for it in the website or there are contacts that we also publicize during the event. I'm going to go to another question, but then I would like to comment on that. This is about Roberta Esmani Marques. A question from Roberta, and this question is to Saraiva. Does the network have the intention to create a group of volunteers to participate of uh, 
citizen science projects. This is interesting. There's an interesting idea for us as a network. I don't know if it's the case I'm of having like a listing or a bank of names. So that would be it would be interesting to have a, a system to announce the opportunities, to match the volunteers with the project opportunities so that people could connect to the projects. This would be interesting. This is a task for our IT uh, team member. Recently, I saw a startup that put, for example, the growers in connect with other growers, uh, rural growers, to match, to make this match. So it would be wonderful to create, create a startup that connects the projects to the citizens who are interested. It would be, it would be very nice. We could start in a very simple way, and after we could structure more. But at this point, it would be easy to make something to make people, to let people know. And this is an, already in our to-do list. Now I have a question to Karen. The Brazilian network of uh, citizen science has any a system to make the projects talk among themselves so that when we have like broader projects in a certain area of study that it can merge with other smaller projects in the same area so we could increase the scope we could exchange experiences so can we connect projects Yes, it's really interesting. Thank you for the question, Priscilla. Yes, one of our proposals is exactly to create this dialogue between different initiatives that we have in Brazil. So from the moment that we can structure and establish this dialogue, also based on the information we got on this event, the questionnaire that was distributed uh, before the event, we can think of strategies and they will then make this uh, proposals materialize. And I believe that your second question about smaller projects that can merge with larger projects to increase the data collection can be also part of a working group. How can we compare data? What's the quality? How does this inform decision making? Well, this is still this construction will be held in a collaboratively approach. This is still open ended, but in the next steps, we can define this as one of our goals. You call our attention for something that is really interesting, to invite people to participate of our working groups. I think we can build a lot together from these working groups. So this is an interesting theme for a working group. Andrea, for example, is interested in that she could engage in a working group with that. Andrea, no, I'm sorry. Priscilla, Priscilla could be part of this working group. A question from Andrea that I passed to Eduardo. She wants to know about if the network has thought about a formal partnership with research institutions and with um, school education departments in the public power. She believes that with a more formalized partnership as a official part of the curriculum in long-term uh, projects 
can help in the construction of a mindset of inclusion of society in the production of science. Simple projects can be incorporated in formal product and the participants disseminate their knowledge at home and in their social groups. All of the participants feel as stakeholders and they are more and more motivated to participate. Excellent collocation. Thank you, Andrea. I want to ask Eduardo and Juliano to talk about this because you have projects that somehow dialogue with that. Juliano's project has to do also with schools. So it would be nice if you could communicate more about that. This is an excellent question because, as Blandina said, me and Juliana, we have some projects of trying to engage schools. And our motivation to work in this network has to do also to, to learn how to do this. Of course, each place where you're going to execute a school, a community or a school has their own context. These contexts are different and independent. In my case and Juliana, we are in Espírito Santo and we took some steps. I think that uh, Juliana is uh, more advanced than I am in my project, but we found some difficulties to discuss ways to execute that. And in a network, it would be excellent because we will have an exchange of ideas. Um, one, I think it was last year before the pandemic. We tried to talk to the people of the state education department in Espírito Santo. We presented our work as an institution trying to establish this partnership, but it did not work. And in the middle of the way, I had to reinvent the project. And I had to do it myself alone. I would, don't want to go further, but I think this could be like the object of a working group. And also to analyze uh, each one of these propositions to see in what working groups could um, w focus on that. But I think it's very useful. Well, thank you. First of all, Andrea, thank you for the question. Well, really, it is one of the factors. This is a network of people helping. And one of the factors is this difficulty of how to keep these relationships. I always work with, uh, I, I come from working with schools and I, we should always have a starting point. In our work with education, we should try to implement that with the different departments of education to showing the importance of the work so that we, they could create this bridge. And this is, there's another important point because this um, connection agent will help us to determine what, which stakeholders are more interested. For example, I work with water management, but so we must find who is, uh, what are the actors that are interested in working with water management? And, but it's a difficulty. As Eduardo said, we found it difficult to insert the Spirit Center state government to engage them. And now I was able to find a contact to engage the municipality. So I've been talking to the education secretary and to find out what institutions want to support, what actors are interested on that topic. I think it's extremely important for us to put this as part of our agenda because I think that different people can help it to do in the best way possible. Thank you, Juliana and Eduardo. There's a, another question that has to do with the suggestion that you gave about the working group that comes from another Andrea. 
about the data would it be able to form group of translators to translate the articles and data establish partnership with the school of humanities where we intend to create a group based on the demand of the people who work for the questionnaire. So in this, um, in this group, I think we can think of the translation of some key articles that are important for citizen science. For sure, this is something to be considered. In this group, we should also think on how to articulate this partnership with schools, how to bring the social actors for these groups so that we can think of educational sequences, projects of education integration and how to put this in schools. As Natalia said, the network intends to do this articulation. We intend to solve all the problems. We intend to become an articulation channel. So I believe that the products of this working group can be then sent to the correspondent uh, decision makers in the sectors that may implement this in a greater scale. So it's up to the network to articulate, to discuss, and build a platform and uh, to propose solutions. We have two questions. I think one was already answered that have to do with the data presented by Natalia in the opening, if they will be available for to be for consultation. As soon as they are published, they will make them available on our website. But there's another question that I want to pass to Saraiva Sheila. And Alice, if you want to comment, a person is called Jadson Fiana da Silva. And this person wants to know if the network has thought of building an online repository to make the access and sharing of a data easier. I, I think I, I may start. Uh, Judson, I, I believe this is very complicated to think about because the data of each product, we as a network, at least for this moment, I uh, I was up talk, but I'm, I'm think, thinking out loud here. Uh, the projects will be in different platforms, and I understand that there will be difficulties already to maintain this in the long run. In a first moment, for the network to maintain that, we can maintain in a form of, of an archive, but uh, I don't know it, it, if it is a way that it will be easy for people to access. This is a discussion that the network may do on how to make this available in the long run. Not that we have the condition to be this, this host for this data. As happened in the discussion in the, in the first uh, panel yesterday of financing, I believe this is the type of situation that some uh, it, that one institution may uh, has as a, a target, for instance, the the Ministry of Science and, and Technology. But for other areas, no. But maybe the Ministry could have a platform for uh, citizen science to to uh, uh, open for, uh, for instance, such astronomy, biology, or their, uh, human sciences. Your question is extremely relevant because all the projects will have this problem that one day the project finishes, the system is extinguished, the uh, professor is re retires, the students go away, and this is a whole effort that goes uh, that will be go, uh, that will go to trash this is not easy to think 
on that for a network because it requires resources. But this is an excellent point for discussion. Well, I believe that we finished the questions. Karin, do you see any further questions in the chat? I don't know. No, not for now. I would just like to mention about the question of the data we will present in the uh, Conference of Citizen Science of United States. So if anyone is uh, uh, is inscribed, uh, is um, in the event, we applied to send a banner, but we will make this data available to have this publication about the results of the, the questionnaire we made before the event. If I can add to what Karin said, different institutions are creating their own uh, repository of data as part of the policy of open data. Because the journals uh, require the data to be published in uh, endless fashion, perennial fashion. So some uh, uh, institutions have, uh, some agencies have, FAPESP is implementing this in the state of Sao Paulo, to have a data repository where people deposit their data of uh, research projects for open access. This may be part of the solu solution. I say part because one of the problems you we may we may have is that the spreadsheets are will be uh, stored there, uh, database will be but unstructured, not good uh, for research. The data are there, the spreadsheets are there, the databases are dead, and that's it. Uh, and to access, you have to mm, download, uh, but it's not easy to have access and search in that in, in that interface. So this is kind of a way to lose the data. May I also comment about the schools? It's an experience that I have, and I believe it, it works. It is very important to have contacts with the education departments, but working directly with um, teachers and principals in schools is very interesting because it ends up reaching the education departments when we find teachers and principals that are excited with the topic. So I'm offering an extension course for a continued education of teachers. And this course led to some students to, to do, um, doing master's degrees and taking to their schools and their principals. And so this is also an interesting path. It's maybe it's an opposite way. It's a, it's a, a baby step job, it's an end job, but it's a, it's a, a good way to include teachers in this process of creating a content for their schools and contexts. Surely we have to, to have both a bottom-up approach as a top-down approach. We need priority, but surely in this uh, grassroots works, it, they have uh, to be uh, that uh, going to action. I believe we finished the questions. Can we go to the conclusions? Well, with this event, we launched the network. But at le the network is still not ready. From the beginning, in the process to build uh, this network, it has been a collective process. Some people interested had this, this dream, and we struggled to materialize this dream and got here. But to continue, we will really need to to be in uh, in this uh, in this boat together and sail together so we expect and we ask you to be patient and wait because we still have a lot to process that was discussed throughout these two days it was an extremely rich event but extremely intense with different proposals 
different ideas, insights that we have to to analyze what is feasible, what is not feasible, what can be uh, incorporated to our proposals, how can we or, uh, organize, uh, reflect about governance. So there's a lot to be discussed and we will keep you posted. Uh, we, will we surely will have another call for those who already answered the questionnaire that are already members of the network. These people are there listed and they will be called initially to be part, take part and to collaborate with us. So I just ask you to be a little patient. I also would like to take this opportunity to, to thank uh, the colleagues and the support of all of those who contribute to be here, to get here. I have to, to admit that I'm really moved for these two days. It was, this is a light in the, in the end of the tunnel of all this darkness we are living. This process uh, reflects one year of work. It was really light that was our north throughout this pandemic. So I would like to thank all of those who worked together, who believed, who walked and I feel now I feel a better person well that's it I won't sp speak no more but otherwise I will start to to cry here and I, I would like to say something briefly for a, a great coincidence I put in our group some days ago that I was really excited to see this network uh, and uh, and I, I just realized that I have the same T-shirt I use in the European Congress of Citizen Science. When I got there and I saw that it was not just what I saw in the uh, bird part, I saw how challenging uh, and the connection with other groups. And I, well, I'm putting the same shirt and it is a pleasure to see this happening i hope that all of those taking part i see some names here that are from ornithology and i would say i hope that you understand that citizen science is not just collecting data and take part in species list there is a huge field for a, a room for engagement so people can understand what is a citizen science? But, well, that's it. I'm very, very happy. And let's carry on with this network. May I go? I will pick Teo and Eduardo. I, I'm also with the same T-shirt of my master's uh, defense. I started with working with citizen science in 2015 uh, by invitation of uh, Blandina that uh, was my tutor in my master's studies and now it is in my PhD. And we were, we built almost alone this line of research and a challenge of thinking inter and transdisciplinary in a course that was a discipline. So, I would like to say that I felt very lost in this process. And by finding all these people that created this network and seeing you all here, it's really, really significant and really, really important and is aligned, totally aligned with the values I, I defend personally and professionally. So it's really significant for me. And I would like to highlight that I really um, uh, feel for the victims of COVID-19. Although we are in a moment of happiness, we, we can't fail to, to remember that it is a very delicate moment that we are living. Many families suffering with their losses. And thank the presence of all of those here and thank people that were in the uh, in the backstage of the event. I mentioned in our group, there was an in injection of uh, uh, motivation while we still don't have a, 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 a 
the vaccine to be injected. And think on citizens as an innovative way and a way that will transform people, creating critical thinking to contribute with the, pro, uh, the resolution of social environmental problems, and that dialogues with society uh, go in, in a different direction of I've all the, uh, other pressures in society. Thank you. Well, after what after Karen, I believe everything is said, and I I make my words the words of uh, Blanche, Antonio, and Karen. That is, these are years that we dedicate to to the study of uh, citizen science, and when we see this getting to people, it's really. A, a reason to be very happy. And this moment is very important because people see that we are really open to the participation of everyone and we want to hear everyone. We may get wrong in this process, so be patient. There will be mistakes on the way, but we count on the collaboration of you all to build this process together and use make use of all communication channels that you have with us. Use our web page to post, to, to disclose um, inf information, events, projects, opportunities. I believe that the network, this is the function of the network and that's what we want to happen. And make all our dreams and ideas come true. I Thank you very much for these two days. It seems that we are in this event for a month already. It's so much information, so rich, uh, so, mu so many learnings. And it seems like a month together. And I thank you a lot. And I hope we can meet again presentially soon. Yes, I also want to say some words. Well, everybody uh, talked already a little bit about the expectations we had. I also started in in sits and science, and I discovered that I worked with sits and science in 2017, so not a long ago. And I imagine how many how many people that um, took part in this event that were like me. They started to discover themselves in the sits and science, and now becoming network. We had great expectations in this event for the launching, and I imagine that many of you taking uh, will take part in great uh, with great expectations to see in terms of network and citizen and science. And I have the impression that we fulfilled all the expectations, ours, because we are very happy with the results of these two days of workshop. And I believe that many of you are also uh, very happy with everything that you heard and all the expectations you have. we have. So it was a great success, very happy with the result. And I hope we continue to fulfill our uh, expectations together as a network now. Thank you. I, I speak right now not to be the the last one. I was the last one to, to come to the group and I'm very happy to have the opportunity and for being received by them. So Mel, then then uh, she, then much more than he. We are a minority, but a very fortunate minority here. In fact, it was a very good surprise. I'm interested in citizen science for a long while and I just exchanged my t-shirt because I, I I take part in this event for more than one decade that is information about biodiversity and data standards for biological cur curation. There are work groups in data standards for citizen science, but didn't advance that much, but there is. Robert Stevenson, Robert Stevenson 
leads that. And there I heard about that for the first time, a long time ago. And then I thought on producing uh, projects with that, with bees that we started a long time ago with uh, information, uh, innovative information systems. And not a long ago, Natalia became a partner in this project. And I, I'm very happy to see this idea of a Brazilian network because working with these systems, I noticed the difficulty of, as other speakers said, the difficulty of working alone, the difficulty of reinventing platforms and fighting for financing major issues that science face and science and we have to face together. This is difficult anywhere in the world. In Brazil, maybe a little more. But the problems are always the same, as Eduardo mentioned. The problems are the same anywhere in the world. But when we are in a network, it helps a lot to solve. It helps being strong enough to face them. And this network came in a very special moment. It depends on the effort of a partnership to face situations that in our case, uh, it is a global situation of difficulties and not only because of the pandemics where a lot of things are being questioned. What we need to question is not our lifestyle, general lifestyle. So the situation is like that because everything is going in a wrong direction. So this is the time to have uh, partnerships so we can work side by side for a better future. That's what I found in this group. And I hope that uh, this is true for everyone that is watching us. I'm happy. I'd like to also uh, thank everyone. You have said it all. I want to thank you for welcoming me in this network. I think this work is really important. I'm happy to participate in this event. It was really interesting because it made it clear all the potential that uh, citizen science has in Brazil with the potentials and the enthusiasm of everyone. Now it's time to build. And the huge challenges that we have ahead of us. This is the moment to uh, put this group together and to organize the next steps because willingness the potential we have. So thank you. I did not want to be the last one, but I think I am. As you all said, I want to agree with you. I think you have expressed my feelings about this moment of the building of the network. When we were like a smaller group, maybe we were not able to do it all. We don't need to do things by ourselves. The best thing is to join forces. This is extremely important. and very gratifying as well. So I want to thank all of you for this opportunity, for this engagement in the construction of the network. For me, it's a dream come true. I'm also not going to speak much more because I'm really touched, I'm emotional, and I hope that you are as enthusiastic as we are for the evolution of citizen science in Brazil. As Shana said, we have a lot of potential, we have a lot of willingness, and now may this network become a welcoming hub, a space for us to work together and discuss together everything we need to grow more and more. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I hope, I think this network may be an example of the strength of the collective, the, 
transformation power of a collective. This is essential. We need that. We need to believe more that the collective is strong and has the power to transform. That's it. So I want to thank you again to say goodbye to everyone and see you soon. So each one happy hour in their own home celebrating. Thank you. Thank you, Sérgio, Silvia, Renata. Yes, that's it. And I want to extend everyone from the Institute of Advanced Studies that gave us all the support. Thank you. Agora as tradutoras podem parar já também, né? Agradeço elas também. Isso aí, gente. Saindo. Abraço para todos. Abraço para todos. Tchau. Abraço. Tchau, tchau. É nóis, pessoal.